There he is. <laughs> there I am. <laughs> All right. Hey. All right, we got some people hopping on here. Yes, awesome. Welcome, everybody. Do not be alarmed that you do not see anybody else but the four faces on your screen. That is all you're supposed to see uh, for those of you that may have never been on a webinar before. So welcome. Got about 50 of us on right now. Um, so we're going to give it a, you know, 30 seconds, 45 seconds or so before we jump in to make sure everybody has a chance to, to hop on. Look at all these friends. Yeah. You want to sing a song, right? I've got a guitar right here. Oh, you know what? It's actually, it's on the porch. <laughs> ah, shoot. I would have you sang a song. You I got your sing. harmonica. Uh, I do have a harmonica on this side. This is kind of the music room that I'm in. So there are See? plenty of oh, instruments. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Jeff, do you have a music room in your house? Uh, no, I people beg me to, if I sing or play any musical <laughs> instrument, they pay me money to stop. So it's actually a little nice. I was just stuff. just curious. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think there's probably a lot of musicians who who would happily take money to not play music right now. I'll bet. So, yeah. Kind of self blessed. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. How long did it take you to grow the beard, Ryan? That distinguished look you got. Now. Um, you know, I I uh, I have only clean shaven three times since high school. So wow. after, oh, after I graduated high school, I just kind of quit. I just I quit shaving. It just wasn't interesting anymore. Okay. I only have to shave three times a week, so I can't relate. <laughs> <laughs> then you can probably grow a great beard. Oh yeah, yeah. Remember the homeless guy? That's right. <laughs> Comes in his blotches. Yeah. Sorry, Jeff. Are you? How are we doing? I think we're doing great. I think we're okay. good. We got about sixty-two on. I'm going to give it just another, um, another couple seconds, and then we'll jump in. And people just keep joining us as we go. Uh, just a reminder for those of you just jumping on: you should only see the four people on your screen. You shouldn't see anybody else. You are muted. You should only be able to hear us. So if that's the position you're in, then you are in the right spot. All right, um, let's go ahead and jump in um, because we know we only have an hour and it's gonna go super fast. Um, real quickly, let's just do a little bit of housekeeping real fast, just in case some of you have never been on a webinar before um, and just a couple things we wanted to make sure that you know. Um, like I just said, you should only see us, you're muted, you're just gonna hear us, and we're gonna to try to make this as, as conversational as possible because we don't just want to talk at you. So hopefully this will come across as almost like you're sitting in your house getting to watch us have a conversation. That's our goal. Um, there's a Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to ask questions during the webinar. Um, we have uh, Betsy. Uh, holler who's on with us and she's kind of compiling some of those questions for us and we're going to do a Q&A at the end um, and if we don't get to one of your questions we'll do our best to get back to you sometime after the webinar um, probably not tonight but sometime soon with an answer to your question because we want to try to answer as many as possible if during the night you're feeling like man I need to talk to a pastor I need a pastoral assistance or I just have a question for a pastor um, or you think maybe I need a counseling referral, please email pastors at thecrossing.church and somebody will get in touch with you. I would just say, hey, I was on the parent webinar. I want to talk to a pastor. Or I need a counselor referral, something to that effect. Uh, if you have questions for kids ministry, you can email kids at thecrossing.church. If you have questions for youth, it's youth at thecrossing.church. So there's a couple of real quick housekeeping things um, before we jump in tonight. Um, and we are recording this, so if you miss it or your spouse misses it or there's somebody that you wish could hear some of this, um, we're recording it and we'll get it up um, on, on the web as soon as we can. So before oh, no. we, before we are we, recording it. That's right. We we're recording, recording y'all. <clears throat> it could happen. Um, and it being a live thing, anything can happen. <laughs> that's right. Back. That's right. Guys. Anything can happen. Um, <laughs> Let's let's real fast. Let's introduce who is on the panel. Um, 
Uh, Ryan, how about you go ahead and start? Tell us a little about yourself, your role. Give us a little description of your current reality. Sure. Uh, my name is Ryan Peters. I get to be the uh, director of the youth ministry at The Crossing. Um, I've been on staff for uh, coming up on seven years. So uh, love what I get to do. get to hang out with a lot of teenagers and all of our youth team um, every week. Um, as a parent, um, I have a third grader uh, who's a daughter. Her name's Emma. And then we have a first grade son whose name's Ellis. Um, so we're, we're right in the smack middle of elementary uh, years. Um, and my wife's name is Nikki. She's a counselor. And um, so currently we're both working from home uh, and we're doing the, the homeschool education life and the work from home life. So <laughs> it's a little bit crazy, but uh, that's the way we're at. Nice. Good words. Cool. Uh, Jeff Taylor, tell us a little bit about you. I, uh, boy, Jeff Taylor, like you said, I am in private practice, been in private practice about 30 years as a therapist, been at the crossing for probably about 21 years now. So I go way back to the why. Um, I specialize in kids and teens. So I'm looking forward to hearing lots of questions. And I know this interaction is going to be good, really good tonight. And for me, what I'm really starting to feel is just an emotional fatigue that's really kind of hit me in the last week. I don't know if any of you guys have experienced any of that, of just not having my normal energy levels. And, and it's, it's um, makes me crave pudding and want to watch Jeopardy. But other than that, I think I'm doing okay. <laughs> and I'm also really missing physical touch. That's, uh, I was walking at, out the hall just before we started and, and a guy was coming out of his office and we both kind of stopped. It was one of those like, you know, you feel like you're breaking the law or something. And I said, well, this is awkward. And he said, yeah, it is kind of. And I said, well, I feel like I should hug you, but that would be inappropriate for multiple reasons. And we both just kind of laughed. So <laughs> I feeling that like that, you know, normal points of interaction, handshakes, hands on the shoulder, just suddenly feel like you're uh, violating personal space. So. Yep. Yep. And we're going to get, get into a little bit of that a little bit later. So Sonia, tell us a little bit about you. Hey, um, so my name is Sonia. I am the mother of three young adults. My youngest is going to be 18 next week, which is hard to say out loud. So they are officially all adults. She's a high school senior, so she's going through a lot of uh, change right now. My middle son is a, a senior in college, so kind of the same kind of stuff going on at a different level. And then I have one who's successfully launched, and all of them have been more or less at home. Um, at least part-time, if not full-time. Um, I also have two dogs. I have a full-time job and a house. I'm recently widowed, so there's all kinds of change happening at our house. I am on staff, uh, officially at Kids Crossing. I am the programming. <laughs> and I also, though, dabble in um, a couple of co-founders of our recovery at the Crossing which has been around for about a year and a half now for people who are struggling with addiction or someone else's addiction. And I'm also um, a coach and a facilitator with the other Jeff, which makes my life very confusing because they're both Jeffs. Um, we do a workshop um, yeah, <laughs> at the counseling center around codependency and boundaries and relationships. Awesome. And I am Jeff Bush. I'm the director of kids ministry. I've been on staff for seven years coming. Yep. Yeah, for seven years. So um, been at the crossing for geez, 12, 13 years, something like that. Uh, my wife is also on staff. Um, we have two little ones. So for those of you that have little rugrats running around, I have a five-year-old daughter and I have a two-year-old son. So we're doing the work from home game while we don't have daycare. Um, it's been an interesting past eight weeks trying to navigate all of those things. Um, so I, I think if you are listening, we've got a good mix of people on the panel that are experiencing probably some of what many of you are experiencing. And so we hope to be really practical tonight. That's our goal. We want to, don't want to be in theory land for you guys. Um, it's to be really practical. One of the things we did want to do um, is real quickly, we wanted to take and ask you guys just a couple of questions. So in just a second, I'm going to, there's going to be a little poll that comes up on your screen and all you got to do is select what you, the, the answer you I think he's going to take a poll. So what did I say? Okay. So there's a couple of polls that like should be showing poll. up. <laughs> he's going to do a little poll. There he goes. 
All right. There we go. Um, so when I when I hit launch polling, it'll come up. You just select what you need and you hit submit. Awesome. And then I'll give us about, I don't know, five to seven seconds. It shouldn't take very long for you guys to, to select where you're at. And then I'll show you the poll. It'll kind of give us an idea of who's on the call. Um, and then we'll, we'll do a couple other questions. Almost everybody's in. A couple more. This is great. We got a super great mix of, of people. So lots of different folks on the call. All right. So there's the poll, just so you guys can see. Here's who's on the call. So it's we got a wide range from everything from infants all the way into that high school range. So that's awesome. Um, cool. Let's see here. Question two. Which best describes you right now? You guys energized? <laughs> Are you tired, but you're still hopeful? You're exhausted? Are you just completely overwhelmed and stressed out? Where are you guys at right now? We don't know who's answering what, so just be as honest as you want to be. Jeff, I was wondering uh, how you managed to book Jerry Seinfeld's apartment for this call. Well, you know, I've got I've got some connections, and you'll see I had it refurbished, but um, I think it looks good. Yeah, I saw Kramer walk by. <laughs> All right, here we go. Pretty cool. We've got a bunch of you that are tired and exhausted, but I love that a bunch of you are hopeful. That's that's super encouraging, and that's. That's kind of one of our goals for tonight is to help make sure you keep that hopefulness up. And last one, we're just curious if you're struggling or maybe just wrestling with any of these, um, what would it be? Emotional or mental health, your physical health, your relational health, or just that work-life cadence? What's, what's the biggest struggle right now? All right. Couple more, and then I'll be able to share these results with you guys. Hmm. Cool. Can you say how cool it is that this is happening? Look at these. People. I know, right? I know. This is awesome. Way to go for engaging with us, y'all. All right. So, a little bit of a split between emotional health and the work life balance, some relational health. Totally get that. It's cool to see that physical health is not not the biggest one. Hopefully that means you're being able to get out and do some things. <laughs> or it means they surrender. Or yes, they surrender. Yes, they, 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 yes, <laughs> yes. They, something had to give, right? That's how this thing works. Right. All right. So thanks for participating in that. That just helps us a little bit um, as we move forward tonight. So, you know, really quickly, can we just call out a couple realities for you guys? And I think, you know, we talked about this yesterday, like, we're all coming at this from different angles. Um, some of you are extroverts and you're really struggling with not being able to be around people. At the same time, you're probably really good at staying connected. So you got a little bit of an advantage over the introverts, except for the fact that some of you are probably introverts and you're loving this. You're like, this has been easy peasy. I just love being at home by myself all the time. Um, but you might be craving some connection after this long as well. Um, some of you probably had a really um, a really good time being able to connect with your kids, especially if they're in elementary or middle school, things slowed down. So now there was lots of family time and that's been awesome for you. And then if we're being honest, I'll be honest, like I'm tuckered out from chasing little ones around the house 24 hours a day for the last 60 days. That's just reality. Um, and I know a bunch of you are in that spot too. Um, so we know the last two months have been really challenging for you guys. Um, in our own ways. It's been different for everybody. Um, the, the, the good thing about it is, is that every single one of us are like learning how to do this day by day. Like there wasn't like somebody that had the playbook of, oh, here's how you go through a pandemic and work from home while your kids are schooling and all those other things. Um, so we know things are getting ready to slowly open back up. And of course, that's all kind of nebulous right now. But we also know that even though school is about to close up, there's still challenges ahead because camps and VBSs and the pools and just lots of other common summertime things 
are probably not going to be available to you. So you're still going to have your kids at home a lot and you may still be working from home instead of going to the office. And I don't know if your daycare is going to open back up or what that's going to look like. So we know there's still challenges ahead um, while others may be getting ready to leave. Um, and I know that for some of you, you're a little anxious about, hey, when are kids and youth going to be able to come back to church? Um, we don't have any specific details on that right now. All I can say is we are having conversations. We're having lots of discussions. We're trying to learn from other churches and organizations about what that might look like. But what we do know is we're not going to open things back up to kids or youth until things are safe. And we can really provide a quality experience that they're used to getting before all of this happened. Um, we've got to figure out protocols and processes. How do you social distance a four-year-old? How do you social distance a seventh grader, right? Like we got to figure all those things out. So we don't have answers for that, but we will definitely um, keep you guys informed as, as things come about. So um, I know that doesn't satisfy some of you, but that's just the reality. We just don't know um, right now what that looks like. Um, so part of the reason behind this webinar is we just want to give you guys some really practical stuff. We want to encourage you. We want you to leave feeling hopeful. Um, so that over the next two months, you come out of this feeling really good. Um, you've made it two months. Let's see what happens two months from now. So um, one of the first things we wanted to talk about was self-care. And I was going to talk about some physical health care, but that seems to be the least of our concerns. So um, can I just say real fast and keep this short and sweet? Like, that's still really important. You guys, um, you have to take care of yourself physically because it affects so many other parts of you. It affects your mental capacity. It affects your emotions. It affects your attitudes. Um, and so just make sure that you're getting out and doing something, even just a brisk walk three times a week. I mean, that's going to do wonders for you. Getting out in the sunshine when you can is going to be great. Taking a bike ride, um, getting your kids and your family involved doing that, right? Your kids are going to pick up habits that you either maintain or start creating right now. Um, I know it's easy to snack all day because we're at home all day, um, but even paying attention to how you're eating, when you're eating, what you're eating um, is, is going to be really important. So I, I just, I'm going to keep that one quick just because that didn't seem to be one of the bigger ones. So, um, but I, I just, we want to stress that physical health is super important. So make sure you're carving out time whenever you can to, to take care of yourself. Um, Sonia, do you want to talk a little bit? Because emotional health was one of those things that kind of was up there. Um, what can you tell us about emotional health? Sure. And I wonder if, if you don't mind, Jeff, could we really, really briefly just kind of touch on what are we seeing in our different areas of work and of ministry? Absolutely. Because that makes it a little bit easier just to kind of touch on the, that emotional health part. So especially when it comes to emotion. So when I'm around older youth um, or young adults, I'm seeing kind of a lot of frustration. Um, things have been canceled, plans that they've had all year, proms, graduations, all those kinds of things. So there's this latent kind of, yeah, irritation there. Um, this idea of online classes is not always terribly satisfactory. There's a little bit of a lack of closure around the year. And so there's, there's these things that are kind of under the surface that I'm sure are there for other um, areas too. And I'm also seeing adults and parents who are struggling a little bit with this emotional health because they're seeing things happening in their family that they didn't see before. So young adults are coming back home and all of a sudden they bring with them these interesting habits and other things that they never really knew about their kids. And they're asking themselves, so how do I parent a 24 year old? You know, where, where are, where am I permitted to say no and yes and, and not ruin the relationship? But then the other thing that we're seeing, at least I'm witnessing in, in my um, coaching and, and in the other areas of work are families who are struggling with other things that are more significant. So if there was addiction or mental illness or any kind of um, other anxieties, depressions, things like that, that were happening now, that's kind of bubbling up to the surface. And so, you know, people are, are starting to leak a little bit. Um, you're, we're just seeing kind of in general a little bit more of the things that were already there before. Um, can I real briefly, Jeff, do you mind if I ask the other two gentlemen real quick what they're seeing before? Absolutely. Happening? Okay. Yep. So Ryan Peters, you're below me on the, uh, on the squares here. C could you share a little bit from the youth perspective? Sure. Yeah. Um, I agree with all that. I think for students, there's a lot of loss. 
Um, and in particular for seniors, there's a lot of loss. Closure is a great word for it. Uh, they don't get to have prom, they don't get to have graduation, they don't get to have senior trips, they don't, I mean, all of those things. So they're struggling with that, right? Um, I would say in particular for, for teenagers, they're at a time in life where they're naturally trying to um, individualize from their, their parents, right? They're, they're trying to become their own person. And oftentimes they're already like drifting towards their group of friends to find identity, to find community. And so to be kind of ripped away from that and, uh, and not have the re those friendship relationships, I think we're seeing a lot of kids who they just want to be with their friends. Um, and it's really hard as a parent then to figure out, okay, well, what decisions do I make? Is it okay for that friend to come over? Can they spend the night? I, we had, a, we had one of our youth small groups this week who wasn't on our zoom call. And we we're like, well, that's weird. Where'd they go? We found out later that the, the girls from the group took it upon themselves to meet in one of their driveways, a social distance and the whole deal, because they just wanted to be around one another. Mm -hmm. So I think for, uh, for a lot of students, there's, there's just kind of um, a, an incongruency with who they were, who they were trying to become, who they, were, who they were around, their social setting, their whole world revolves around friends, school, that, that social world. And for that to just all of a sudden not exist, is just, it's just difficult. So, um, so you have everything from kids who that causes lots of anxiety um, because they can't be in that world to uh, I know students who they had a lot of anxiety because of school. And now that they're not at school, their anxiety levels actually dropped. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, now they, they're, they're still sad, they're still experiencing other losses, but it's definitely all over the map. And it depends a lot on what things are like at home. So um, yeah. all over the map, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. And Jeff Taylor, I know you're going to talk a lot more about some of these things, but could you give us just a little bit of an overview of the kinds of things that you're seeing different from non-COVID times? I, I'm seeing a lot of the things that you guys are seeing. And one of the things that I think, and, and, and I think all of you touched on this, is that this is unprecedented. This, uh, on Thursday or whatever day it was, we were living in a certain way. And within almost hours, certainly days, our life completely changed. And like we were talking about yesterday, I think it can be helpful to find terms that fit with what we're feeling. Do you guys want to take it for just a second? Let me make sure yeah. Hey, while he's doing that, like, and, and I've got the little ones at home, right? So there's a little bit of difference there. They don't, like my five-year-old doesn't feel the loss. She's actually enjoying being at home. And of course the younger one, like this is, this is coup de gras, right? Like mom and dad are home all day long. So I think for the little guys, they don't notice it, but the parents are struggling and wrestling immensely because we're not teaching school, but like when my two-year-old needs me, my two-year-old just needs me. And it doesn't matter if I'm on a, on a call with work or what's mm -hmm. happening, like, or if the diaper has to be changed, right? Cause it's gotta be changed. Like those things have to happen. And so the little kids, I don't think are feeling this as much, although my daughter completely understands COVID. We have talked to her about what this virus is and how we're trying to keep people safe. And that's why we wear masks outside and, and those types of things. Um, but I think it's the, it's the parent side that's, that's more difficult with those little ones at home. So Jeff, go ahead, finish what you were gonna say. Yeah, one of the things I, that I think where I left off um, is that Understanding the starting point, and I know this sounds basic, but understanding what we're feeling is key. And what I, I think what I was specifically saying was yesterday, we were talking about this universal, literally global grief that we're all experiencing. Like I was saying a minute ago, that's unprecedented and that it's hard to even find terms for. But when I talk to people, and, and a lot of times, as odd as this sounds, people aren't aware that they're depressed. People aren't aware that they're grieving. Um, they tend to view it as something that's a deficit in what they're doing or believing or feeling. And so just starting from that point of that awareness of, oh, I'm grieving. Yeah, because grief's about loss. It, it's, it's not exclusive to what we tend to think of, which is death. It's, it's the loss of things that we love. And, uh, and that means so many things right now. The loss of seeing friends for young people, like you were touching on Ryan and Sonia and 
And the fact that you can see them in certain ways, you can interact with them like we're interacting, but is it the same? No, it's far from it. And so like when I talk to people specifically about the area of emotions, and so I call it the AA principle. So it's awareness and attribution and the ability to look and go, I am really feeling a sense of grief or sadness or even depression associated with these things that are now absent in my life. That's a starting point to create movement of some of the things that we're going to get into, which are the practical steps that we can then take. Because I, I think a lot of people aren't even really aware of that at a certain level right now. And they're beating themselves up. You know, that maybe they're framing it around a lack of gratitude and or, or faith, both of which are extremely significant and important through this. Um, but the, the awareness of I need to feel what I feel and the ability to communicate it. And that gets into a lot of things too with, you know, if we're not understanding what we're feeling as adults and as parents, how can we helpfully affect our kids and our teens to walk through this? Yeah. And, and Jeff, could I just piggyback on that? Um, I, and again, I know you're going to say more about this, but one of the things that I think is so important as parents going through, we can get ourselves into a lot of trouble because then we react to every mood in the, the house. Oh, can you guys hear yeah. me again? I'm sorry. Yeah. So you were saying so something we, profound, but we missed it. <laughs> I'll try to, <laughs> I'll try to piece it back together again. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, when it comes to our feelings and the feelings of our kids and the people that we love, one of the biggest um, struggles that we have, especially at parents, is that we don't like our kids to be unhappy because then somehow we feel unhappy. And, you know, those, those kinds of, we call them codependent behaviors, but they're really just, we don't like the discomfort and learning right now this is a great time great time to teach your kids about feelings about emotions and simply to validate yeah you're frustrated with that even if they have a blow up let's come back and talk about that for a second what was going on you were frustrated that you couldn't see your friends i hear you that's a bummer just validating what they're feeling without telling them well you know there's kids in other places in the world who never that, that doesn't help it doesn't help me yes it certainly doesn't help my kids and even sharing when it's age appropriate hey you know what i got frustrated too so what do you think it is that could help us what would help you in, in problem solving with them so to me when it comes to sort of emotional health just that recognition of what we're feeling and allowing the people around us to have their feelings without feeling like we have to fix it or make it go away is a huge a huge starting point. And, and what you're describing really well, well there um, just is empathy. Empathy is a powerful experience. It's a simple word, but it heals our soul. And like you're describing, you know, to utilize that effectively with kids and teens and enter their world, don't interrupt, like I think you're getting to. Um, don't tell them that what they're feeling they shouldn't feel. And that gets to what you're talking to. It's not that you don't you want them to not be in pain. And then ask, would you like for me to throw out some ideas? Would you like to brainstorm some ways that we might be able to figure out how to make that better? I think just that simple three-step process can be huge in terms of just finding those practical ways to make things better. Not jumping to the solution like I think you're saying, Sonia. What we're going to say, yeah. Jeff? Yeah, I was just going to say, we talked a little bit about that, but the fact that our kids are just, they're little humans, right? Like regardless yes. of what age they are, like they have the same feelings, they have the same emotions, they have many of the same thoughts we do as adults. They maybe can't express it like we do, or they, they're not mature enough to understand what's going on. But like, if you're feeling lost, if you're feeling like frustrated, if you're feeling like just everything is going the wrong way, there's a good chance your kids might have some of those same feelings because they're losing things maybe differently than you are, but they are losing and they're feeling frustrated. I want to go, I just want to go hang out with my friends or man, I just wanted to do this. I missed this end of this school year thing. You know, for fifth graders, it was, I missed all the end of elementary celebration stuff. And now school's just going to kind of end. Fifth graders missed all of the end of the year stuff. Brian, you could speak to some of the, the youth there, I'm sure. Yeah. True, yeah. and we need to talk to Seinfeld about his internet uh, service. Well. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> we finished for you, Jeff. Thank you. Um, you hey, hey, Jeff, could you talk a little bit, like, about, like, if you're a parent and, like, you're just super overwhelmed, like, you're, 
you're kind of at your breaking point. Like, mm-hmm. regardless of what age your kids are, regardless of what you're doing, like, you're just, you're at that point where it's like, I'm about to break. Do you, what, what could you say to them right now? Let, let me try to say some things real fast, which isn't easy for me. So you guys jump in or do this or whatever, you know, that it, <laughs> but um, one of the, I, I like templates to start with. That's very helpful for me. And, and we touched on this briefly yesterday, but that when we're super stressed, when we're overwhelmed and the explosion might be anger, the explosion might be tears, there's two umbrellas to look under and to start with. And that's decompression and expulsion. And decompression, they're both self-explanatory, but decompression obviously is uh, listening to relaxing music, doing relaxation techniques, doing something that relaxes you away from the stress that you're feeling. Expulsion obviously is an expelling of the energy. It's uh, intense physical exercise. It might even be going for a walk. It's something proactive in terms of getting that energy out. Now, let me let me touch on this again, try to do it quickly, but with so, for adults, I encourage them typically to start with decompression, um, uh, doing something that literally, at, and the quicker you catch it, the faster you're aware, this goes to everything that we're talking about, because I think one of the things that's happening now is that there's a level of despair that people are getting to, and they're not recognizing the signals that are associated with it until they get to that place. That, and so being aware of, you know what, I have got to have some time uh, to pray, to meditate on scripture, to listen, like I said, to listen to relaxing music, to do something uh, to decompress away from that. Now, for kids, I encourage you want to start always with with expulsion. And let me tie that into something that I think you asked, Jeff, or Sonia said. Um, kids are saturated with screen time. Inter- I'm not telling you about anything they don't know, but it's more so now than ever. And what they're starving for is significant points of connection. So if you're getting to the point as a parent where it's, you're like, I'm gonna explode, or you're recognizing that your kids are about to, or it's a nuclear explosion of everybody in the family, a great place to start, or at least to integrate into the whole process is points of connection. And we connect three ways. We connect through eye contact, physical touch, and verbally. And so one of the things that's happening, and this ties into gaming and, and you know TV and all different kinds of things, is that um, that saturation point is happening quicker for kids, and they're exploding faster. So doing things, and hopefully this will tie into some of the practical stuff, doing things is, um, like I encourage family meetings, that getting together, and, and this ties into everything that we're talking about, and talking about um, the different places of where everybody's at in the family. You could do it in a variety of ways. What's the best two words that describe where you're at right now? And for a five-year-old, it might be, this is stupid, meaning the family meeting, you know, but they're talking, you know, that it, and then strategize. I was talking to a dad today and he started doing that. And one of the things that they've done is they started planning a day trip as quickly as they can do it as a family. And he said, that just brought energy into the room. You know, that sense of heaviness that everybody was feeling uh, started to lift. So there's a lot there. I told you I would ramble. What are your guys' thoughts? No, I think uh, I think all of that's good, and I think it's important those trying to find those ways to let kids express what they're feeling, talk about it with them, let them know, you know, is there something, if, if it's possible, like, is there something we could go do now that things are slowly starting to reopen? Like, what is something that you've been lamenting or that you have lost that maybe now we could attempt to do let's start let's start planning some things for the future because that that does bring energy it brings hope it brings oh man i might be able to go do that now um even if it's just sitting around and having a family game night whatever that is like get in and and, and letting natural conversation happen but just remembering to not brush whatever your kid might say off as, oh, you're just a kid you don't understand. Like, no, just take it, take it seriously and like let them express their emotions. And again, have that empathy for whatever it is that they're feeling. Um, you know, my daughter is only five, like I said, but she, you know, she was in dance class and she worked all year and then the dance recital never happened. And so it was good to just hear her say, I'm really sad that I don't get to go do my dance recital with my friends. And it's like, I could look at that and go, well, you're five. You have all kinds of life left to do all kinds of fun things. But that would be, 
you know, discounting her feelings. And so it was that time to go, yeah, I know mom and dad are really sad too. You worked really hard to perform for us and we're just so sad for you. And I think that was just super affirming to her that it's okay to have those feelings of sadness even at age five. Yeah. And you know what, Jeff, why I think that's such a great example is that it, I call them turning no's into yeses. And, and that might be something that it, an example of that she could do a recital for, through Zoom for the family, or you guys could tape it. And when the family gets together, when this is all over and friends, you know, you could show it. I mean, there's a variety of ways that you can, uh, in a certain way, turn those things around and make it into something that it, maybe not right now, maybe right now, but that you can celebrate that with her in unique ways. Yeah, that's a great idea. What were you going to say, Ryan? Well, I was just going to say, um, I, I love the de uh, decompression versus expulsion. And I think partly um, one thing that happened for us recently, we noticed, uh, and a few other people have mentioned this, that our third grader and first grader were just um, emotionally tapped out, right? I mean, it took, in the past, it would take a lot for them to just to break down and lash out or burst into tears or whatever that that moment was. And now their, their emotional capacity is tapped, right? They're already, they're already experiencing so much. And so they only have so many tools to deal with all the things that they're feeling. And so w when that toy breaks, it's, that's the biggest thing ever. When uh, they get in an argument, it used to be they could work it out and they're having a really hard time working it out now because they just don't have the emotional energy for it. Um, one of the things that, that I know a number of people asked about um, is just screen time. And we've always tried to be really conscious of screen time um, because we've found that our kids get, tend to get irritable if they have too much screen time. They, they all kinds of reasons, right? And, and in the midst of all this, like many of us, we have laxed on that majorly, right? Like we're exhausted. And so the kids will wake up early and you know go play whatever on the ipad and for an hour before we get out of bed and they're waking up earlier and earlier we noticed in order to have more screen time and what was happening is by the time we even started our day as a family they they had already been on a screen for 60 or 90 minutes mm. now is 60 or 90 minutes the end of the world in in this scenario that we're in i i don't think so i think every family is going to make those decisions for themselves but, but we realized, we're like, you know, starting their day on a screen is disaster. It is a disaster. So we, we took that away. We said, hey, guys, we're making new rule. We will not be on any screens until after lunch. I talked to a parent the other day. Their rule is we, no screens until after 4 p.m. Whatever that is, what, what's changed even just in the last three days is they have to start their day by doing something, something that engages their mind by physically playing by uh, playing together. And it has, even in just three days, we're like, oh, you can, <laughs> there we go. Now we're starting our day on the right foot. So um, I love, Jeff, when you talk about just practical ways, how can you guys as parents find, find ways to change the system, uh, to change the circumstance just, just slightly so that um, we're, you're kind of setting things up better for success, knowing that we're all already tapped out emotionally. That's right. And I, I, think, I think, Ryan, what you're saying is super important. And I know we're two months into this, right? But we're trying to set ourselves up for maybe some better times ahead. And so creating those schedules as best you can, trying to get in those rhythms as best as you can. And I agree with you, like we're lax as well with screen time. And some of that is, it's the best option sometimes when my wife and I are both on the same call or we both have calls at the same time. Sometimes that's the thing that it's like, yes, can you just watch or do this for the next 45 minutes? And when we're done, we'll play a game together. Or when I'm done with this, then we can go outside and play and, and, and get them off of the screens. And, you know, I was thinking the other day, and I know that it's, it's more frequent than, than, than now, but like when I was a kid, like I used to go home after school and watch the Flintstones and the Jetsons and I'm aging myself now, but whatever. Um, or Saturday mornings, it was, it was two hours or three hours. It was Saturday morning cartoons, right? It was Bugs Bunny for an hour and it was Scooby-Doo and all those things. So I don't think it's gonna, we're not gonna do any 
long-term harm, I don't think, if we're having to, to bend a little bit with the screen time. But I do agree there are ways for us to try to create some rhythms and some, and some schedules where we can make sure that, yeah, it's time to turn off screens for the next however long and you can do it later. Um, which I think one of those things is um, sometimes we feel like, well, if they're not doing screens, then what are they doing, right? And sometimes that's easy because some kids love to read or they like to do art projects or whatever. But one of the things I know Sonia always talks about is let them be bored, right? So do you have anything else you want to say about that, Sonia, about that boredom piece? Well, let me say one really quick thing, though, before, because I love this idea of pulling the family in, because I have found that kids are actually quite reasonable when we pull them in, when we give them a voice, and when we say, listen, I'm your mom, and it's my job to make sure that you're healthy, you know that sitting in front of a screen all day is not good for you. We've had that conversation ad nauseum, so help us. How can we figure this out? It's interesting how compliant they can be when they feel like they have a voice. So I would just add in at that family meeting, wherever, talk about it. Sometimes my kids even monitor themselves more than I would. They even set, you know, less time. Um, and so I just pull them into that. The boredom thing, I tell my kids all the time, you got 10 figures and 10 toes. Imagine the possibilities. I mean, you know, kids are going to create when they're bored. And of course, when they're little, boredom isn't necessarily a good thing because they're going to maybe start destroying things. But when they're old enough, they will push through the boredom and they'll start building forts and they'll start looking at dust bunnies and making things out of them. And it's great for their creativity. So we need to, as parents, push through when they say, oh, I'm so bored. My first response is awesome. I can't wait to see what you create, what you make out of it. Yeah. Someone, someone asked about... Um, what do I do if I have a, a young teen who isn't interested in doing anything other than playing video games online with friends, too old for craft, doesn't want to read, doesn't have siblings, stays up too late. How do I motivate them? I'd love to hear what Jeff Taylor has to say about that. But I think even what you just pointed out, Sonia, is at some point you have to work together with them to come up with an appropriate boundary and just recognize we can't have infinite screen time. We can't have infinite online video game time. And they'll have to figure out how, what to do with that, with the rest of that time. But they will never do it if they don't have to be in that situation. Jeff Taylor, what, what would you say for someone who has a teenager who is just unmotivated to do anything else other than just be in that online world? Let me, let me just explain a few things really quick. And, and I, I think Jeff was pointing this out. Where we're at now is an extremely important context. So I want to make sure that we start with that. But um, the screen, what's on the screen does make a difference. The Flintstones, Jeff, which is apparently your favorite show now, that, that is totally different than certain types of gaming. Um, and here's the 30 second version as to why. The gaming industry makes money by making games that are never ending. Our brains need beginnings and ends. And so to date myself like you, Jeff, when I was a teenager and went to the arcade or wherever, the beginning of the game started when I put a quarter in and it ended when I ran out of quarters. Well, that's gone. That's archaic. Um, any of those games now you can get and never stop playing. So why I'm saying that in the context of your, your question, Ryan, is that what they're to watch TV is actually less because here, here's why physiologically. It stimulates what's called the primitive part of the brain, which is where the amygdala is, and it puts um, adrenaline cortisone in our system. And the gaming industry wants to keep it in a certain range. So in that range, it's like the, riding a roller coaster or, or watching a scary movie for a teenager. It stimulates them enough that it keeps them interesting. They don't want it to go too high because they'll stop and they don't want it to go too low, so they stop. So a starting point of some practical tips are gaming six hours straight is different than gaming for an hour, taking a break, gaming for an hour or two, taking a break. So integrating that into the system, I would say is a good place to start. Secondly, what happens is that the lack of motivation oftentimes is severely stimulated or even caused by the amount of gaming. A couple of points there. One is, is that a key point of awareness is the amount of time, literally, that they're gaming. And what research shows in a week-long period, seven days, over tw the farther you get over 20 hours, 
the more of an issue obviously it becomes and even can become an addictive type behavior. So getting it down below 20 hours is a good starting point. Secondly, and this is oftentimes the most concerning thing, is that it's processing negative emotions in the context of the game. What does that mean? So it's when stressors are happening that the context of coping with those emotions is gaming. And so that can contribute to that lack of motivation and not wanting to do anything. There, is, there are gaming addictions. That's a real thing. And one of the things that happens in that context, it doesn't mean that they're addicted to gaming, but when they're gaming too much, is to be in the real world is actually more stressful. Because when you think about it, one of the things that's most addictive, and now I'm using the term loosely in the context of gaming, is the control. I'm in control in that world. And to be in outside of that um, becomes anxiety producing. So I think, and you were touching on this, Sonia, I think at least as a starting point of creating structure. When you read, and I know most teens, especially guys, you know, aren't really into reading, but it stimulates a whole different part of your brain. It stimulates your creativity. It stimulates your imagination. You are creating in your mind what you're reading. And so gaming is a form of cognitive laziness. So uh, whoever asked that question, which is a fantastic question because so many parents are dealing with this now, but there is no question. And I can tell you this from daily experience almost is that your teenager has gifts and passions that will completely create motivation. And it's finding those things because this gets into God's design. When you're doing what God's designed you for, gaming and entertainment because I don't mean that there's no pull, but it lessens it mm -hmm. because it is there. It's, that's why it's zaps motivation. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah. And does anybody else have anything they want to say about screens? Cause we did have quite a few people ask those questions like what's the balance. And I feel like I'm giving myself a ton of grace with that. And I think, I think we've answered most of that. I think the reality is you do have to give yourself some more grace with that and know that you're not going to necessarily ruin your child, especially if they're younger because they spend a couple more hours watching a Netflix show or whatever. It, 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 they're going to be okay. And I think, I think we, can, we can be hopeful of that because as things start to open up, now we can get back out and go to the park at least, or we can maybe go to a neighbor's house and, you know, as long as we're within all the guidelines of what the state and the county want us to do, but as things open up, the TV will become hopefully less and less in their face or their phone or their tablet will become less and less in their face. But right now, like Ryan was saying, it's what's there all day long because you're stuck in the house. We did have a, uh, somebody ask uh, about the emotional outbursts of a young child. What happens when they come out of nowhere because they're emotionally tapped out? And you're kind of tapped out. So how do you stay calm and keep from yelling um, because you're tapped out? I I'd like to answer that because I can, I have, that's, that's where I'm at. And so I think, I think what I'd love to say to that is um, sometimes you're going to yell. Sometimes you're going to respond the wrong way, the way you wish you wouldn't have. Um, because sometimes when you're tapped out, it just happens, right? You you speak before you think. And I am guilty of that over the last eight weeks with a two-year-old and a five-year-old who sometimes get to that point. Um, and so I would just say, give yourself grace. But more importantly, what's most important, I believe when that happens, is a little bit after that. Maybe it's at bedtime. Maybe it's whatever. You go back to that child and you get to say, hey, remember earlier today when... Mm -hmm you said whatever, or you did whatever, and mommy or daddy, we just totally blew it. We responded, we yelled, or we just got super frustrated. Can I say I'm sorry about that? And I'm gonna work hard not to respond that way the next day, or the next time mm -hmm. that happens. And can you forgive me for that? Because that's not who I wanna be as your parent. Um, and we all make mistakes. I think that's super important. That validates that your child was not, was not a bad person. They were just having a rough moment and you had a rough moment, right? And so I think that's super critical to, you got to give yourself grace because that's going to happen. That was going to happen whether we were in COVID or not, right? You're, you're going to get upset. You're going to get frazzled and yell at your kid or fly off the handle. And then two, 10 minutes later, you're going to say, I handled that completely wrong, right? So then go make it right.
go back to your kid, whatever age they are. I don't care if they're three or if they're yep. 23, go back and just say, I messed up. I screwed it up. I'm going to be better. Please forgive me. And, and that's just going to help heal that relationship super fast. I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in on that, but that's how I feel about that one. Yeah. I, and I, I, go ahead, Sonia. I was just going to add one thing. And that is I've always learned what you just said, Jeff, there's no but in the apology. An apology says, I was wrong, and would you forgive me? And the, the, the way the relationship can be mended and the trust in doing that, when you go on then to say, or if somebody goes on to say, but you this and that, you've ruined the whole apology. And so it is okay for us as grownups to say to our children, I was wrong. Yep. yep. Go hey, ahead, we've got We've got about uh, 10 more minutes, guys, and I want to pay attention to time real fast. So, and I want to give a chance to do a couple of questions, but, but if we could, Ryan, will you just touch a little bit about, cause all this stuff is so great, right? But the majority of us on here are probably following Jesus to some extent. And so really none of these things are going to go super well, and we're not going to be able to do this without the guidance of Jesus. I recently, I heard this great quote that, you know, my leading my family begins with following. I got to follow Jesus first if I'm going to lead my family. Yeah. So can yeah. you just talk to us a little bit about like, if we're not being spiritually healthy right now, or we're not getting that God time, what, what that, what that's going to do for us if we will do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, and I think it even ties into what we were just talking about too, because um, we, we need Jesus. I mean, when I, when I screwed up with my kids or when they go off the handle, the, I'm, I am in, even in that moment going, okay, God, will you help me in this moment? Because I don't have it. I don't have the patience. I don't have the emotional energy. Uh, I don't even sometimes have the words to, to say. And so uh, I would say, I think it's key. I think it is so key. Uh, if, if we're like Jeff Taylor is saying in unprecedented times, and we're going through unprecedented amounts of, um, uh, of grief, of loss, of confusion, of uncertainty, fill in the blank. In my mind, we, we should be making an unprecedented plea to God to help us in these times. I know we've all heard this and it sounds to some like a, like a cute little idea, but the first five uh, idea that Greg shared on the weekends a few times, for me, that's turned into like a more than five because it, it is difficult for me to even get out of bed some mornings before going, God, I need, I need you today. So I think in terms of our spiritual health, I would say, um, I would even just go to Philippians four, right? Uh, where Paul says that we, uh, we bring everything by prayer and petition to Jesus and that he gives us peace that passes understanding. That's how I'm trying to live each day. And I, I think if we can start our, our days, uh, in whatever spiritual disciplines, uh, that we already have going or what that looks like. It could even be just five minutes. For me this season, it's been, it's been before I pick up my phone, before I do anything else, I am starting my day off in prayer, asking God to give me energy, give me grace, uh, help me to, to have patience with my kids. So practically speaking, I know that looks different for everyone. Some, some people will want to wake up early and open up scripture. Um, or maybe go on a walk or find a, a quieter place in your house where you can, where you can be in prayer, but find some way to start your day seeking God uh, to help you as a parent. We got to be praying for that. And then even in moments when your kids are losing it, I'm even praying in those moments and we know we're going to screw it up, right? We know we're going to screw it up, but that's what I, that's what I would say um, is just, just start by going to God with those things and asking him to be the parent that he wants us to be. Sweet. Hey, Betsy, can you uh, unmute and, and share any questions that have been coming through that we could try to answer in the next couple minutes? Yeah, so um, a couple of them. One, um, talk about what to do when you have an only child, no matter what age they are, and that there aren't the peers or the siblings to um, spend time with them. And then the one after that, I, I, I'm seeing um, general questions not just about how to parent the child, but the parents and the work-life balance between um, a parent who's working at home full-time and a stay-at-home parent, and how do they give each other time, 
And um, also if, uh, if one of them maybe is working outside of the house and comes home and throws routines off and things like that. So anybody have any thoughts about the only child? I can jump in on that one. That it, one of the things, uh, there's someone that I'm working with, he's, uh, what is he? he's about 13, only child. And um, one of the things that he's doing on a regular basis now is uh, Zoom, um, um, what do you, not um, sleepovers, that makes him sound like a 12 year old girl. What, uh, you know, because <laughs> she would kick me if you heard me say that. But I mean, it, it's something that has really worked well with him. And people come in, they play games. One of the things they're doing is they're doing a marathon game of risk. They're having a blast, you know, that, and, um, he actually, they actually have some other members of the family staying with him, but everybody's older. So he, you know, he feels like he's living in a nursing home, you know, compared to what he wants to be doing. So I think again, going to that creative ways of what, because other parents are starving for that too, doing bike rides with safe distancing, doing hikes with that, you know, with distance, that, that kind of stuff, it, it moves in the direction. It's not perfect, but it moves in the direction of what we need. And let me tie in, Real quick, one of the things that I love what you were saying, Jeff, that the words I'm sorry from dad are powerful mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times, or at least sometimes we apologize through behavior and honestly, especially as men. And so when we say it and we validate what they're feeling, that is just huge. And I think just something to maybe even add on to that is that to say, I wanna make sure, and you don't have to do it in the context of an apology, but I wanna make sure every day we get just you and I time. And I know that it's, we're, we're seeing plenty of, you, of each other, but I wanna mark a time where it's just you and me. And you get to pick. What game do you wanna play? This is for like 10 and under, you know? Don't do this with your fingers. <laughs> your eyes and cross their arms, and ask you to get back on your medication. But for younger kids, you know, especially at your age, or your kid's age, Jeff, they're starving for that and marking those moments. And then it creates reference points. Because then when you're look, recognizing those moments where there's an explosion coming, just from all the pent up energy, like you were talking about, Ryan, the expulsion, then you can say, hey, we've got our time together after dinner. What do you think, what do you want to play? And it creates a point where they're now focused on connection. And then you can brainstorm with them. You know, that, and you know, sometimes you can even do outings, go for ice cream, get it delivered. I mean, there's all kinds of things that you can do. Kids are starving right now more than ever, all of us are, for connection. Mm -hmm. And it's a corny way to say it, but deprivation produces appreciation. And we want to be around each other and interact with each other in ways that we've, and finding any way where that happens is gonna do a huge amount to lessen that anxiety and those breaking points that we're all reaching not entertainment, which is a great point in terms of at times, and I love what you were saying again, Jeff, it's going to happen. Like meaning that um, we need to give ourselves grace and recognize that right now I, screen time is my best option. And I know we're almost out of time. Yep. Uh, real quick. And I'm going to go over just a little bit because I'd love to just have a quick conversation, but maybe even Ryan, you could jump on this or Sonia. This whole idea of the work-life balance and, and everybody's in a different spot. Some have kids that are in school, some mm -hmm. don't, some the, the parent is still going to work, some they aren't, some it's a stay-at-home mom and I'm a full-time worker, maybe both parents are working at home, but just anything you want to say to that, how do you, how do, you do that together? I, I talked to someone today who confessed to me that one of the things that was absolutely devastating for her was just that she wasn't getting enough sleep. And so I think that when we start First of all, the communication aspect of it, of it is huge, Con that constant communication and negotiating, you know, who can do what, who, who can do what today, maybe it's hour by hour, just staying in the loop. But those basic needs, if we're not sleeping, if we're not eating enough, drinking enough water, it throws everything else off. So I would say just make sure that when you're prioritizing, you don't skimp on the things they are going to set the foundation for you to just survive. So negotiate that time where somebody gets to go out and have a walk or somebody gets to run. And some things are going to have to fall by the wayside. They just are. And getting used to maybe the house not being as clean as you want it to be or the yard not looking as great. Nobody cares. You might think you care. But really, I would say prioritize and just continue to communicate with each other. Awesome. Ryan, you got anything? 
Yeah. Uh, I, well, I think the, the term balance has always been a little interesting to me um, because sometimes it can give the impression that everything should be equal all the time. And I, I think it's, that's just not the case. There right. will be times where you have to work. That is the priority. And there will be other times, though, when then you need to make family the priority. You need to make, as Jeff Taylor was just saying, a one-on-one -on -one time or whatever that need is that your, that your child has, a conversation or sitting next to him and watching a movie, then that needs to become the priority. One thing that's been somewhat helpful that I've just kind of maybe learned from a couple articles and, and from a few of us as we've kind of went through this is trying to help my kids understand really clearly when I'm working, when I'm not working. Mm -hmm. um, I'm lucky enough to have a room in the house that, that we, we put a desk in when this started. And my kids know if I'm in here and the doors are closed, I'm working. And I best as, as best I can, when I walk out of here, I try to switch gears back into being dad. Now, I know that's not, that's not the case for everyone, but if you can create that kind of a signal for your family to know, oh, hey, dad's in work mode, so he may not be as available. Or hey, mom's, when she's over there and she's on the phone, that me, or whatever that is for you, especially for younger kids, because it can just be very confusing, right? Um, typically when you're home for many of us that means you're available you're a parent kid is priority and now when you're home some of your times at work so my biggest suggestion is just find ways to to delineate clearly to explain it to your kids and then uh, to, to Jeff Taylor's point if you're able to point to hey I'm working right now from until three o'clock but at three o'clock we're going to do this I've found that to be extremely helpful when I can manage it. <laughs> yep. So, Okay. Hey, uh, I, man, I think we could talk for another hour easily. And mm -hmm. I think some of the parents would hang on and stay with us, but we need to respect time. And, and maybe that's a, a sign that we need to do another one of these maybe fairly soon, um, potentially. Um, I'd love to hear. And, and before we do this, just let me say, we, we know we didn't get to all of your questions. If your name is on a question, Betsy is capturing those questions. If you sent in an anonymous question and you really want to hear from one of us, will you just make sure that you either send your question again to either kids at the, at the crossing church or youth at the crossing church, or even if you want to do pastors at, and we will get back with you um, with an answer. We might even ask Jeff Taylor if it's more up his alley to give us what he would tell on the screen. So please, if you want a question that we didn't get to tonight, please send it to us because we would love um, to help to help in any way that we can. Before we jump off of here, can you guys give like your last one one minute thought? 30 seconds, one minute. What, what's the last thing you want to leave parents with before we jump off tonight? Uh, Sonia. If you are struggling to a point where you're starting to feel like you don't know what to do, ask for help. Counselors are available online. Coaches are available online. There are hotlines. Do not be ashamed. Do not feel like you have to figure this all out on your own. Uh, nobody can. And so please, you know, please, please, please reach out for help. That's great. Jeff. Honestly, and I know this is the theme, um, connection, connection, connection. Um, reading books together, uh, asking God to give you creative thoughts that you never could have on your own, um, to connect with your kids, to connect with friends. Um, I just think that is such a crucial aspect of what we're all dealing with right now and the grief that we tied into and just the, the explosions, uh, a foundational aspect of that is when we're disconnected, it creates anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. And when you remove that space and you push against it, um, it, it really does make a huge difference. Awesome. Ryan. Yeah, I, I, uh, at risk of being redundant, I would say um, we got to lean on, we got to lean on Jesus through all this. And I know that can sound trite or like a pat answer. And that doesn't mean that we do it on the, on our own, like Sonia was just saying, and it doesn't mean that it's magic uh, <laughs> and that we don't need to use all the resources available to us, whether that's a counselor or pastors or a youth or a kid's team. Um, there, there are lots of ways that we can come at this, but I, I would just remind us that, uh, that we have to be going back to Jesus and going, will you give me the strength for today? Will you help me be the parent that you've called me to be? 
Will you help me to be more like you today? Will you give me extra grace? So my encouragement would just be, we lean on him. The tougher that this gets, the more that we need to lean in Jesus. That's awesome. And for me, I would just say, avoid the comparisons. If you're on social mm-hmm. media and you're seeing all these things that it looks like parents have it all figured out and they're doing all these wonderful things, stop believing that lie because it's not true. Yeah. There's, there might be a small percentage that really are doing this really well and, they're, and, and they've got some things figured out. But the majority of us are taking this day by day we have our failures, we have our successes and everything in between. And and I can't, I can't iterate enough what both Jeff and Ryan said. We have to start by following Jesus. We have to start by bringing everything to him and we got to communicate. We got to start having conversations with our spouses. We got to start having conversations with our kids and as a family together, talk through what we're feeling, what's going on. That's the best place to start. And yes, Sonia, if you are struggling, if you are to the breaking point, get help. Reach out to pastors at thecrossing.church. Go to one of those counselors online. You do not have to feel any guilt or shame, and, and you don't need to do this alone. So, I, I, yeah, I just love what all three of you just, just said at the end there. Um, we're going to finish up. We'd love to pray over all of you because we just feel like we got to take it all to God. He's the one who can sustain us through this, and he's the one who can who can help us through the most challenging times. And even when we're celebrating during this time, which I hope we're getting to celebrate during this time as well. So Ryan, if you would, if you wouldn't mind, would you close us out in prayer tonight? Sure. Father, um, I just want to lift up so many parents who are watching now, God, whether they're watching this live, whether they're watching this later, God, you see them, you You ordain them to be parents, God. You are with them and you know what they're going through, Father. And I am asking you to be present in their lives. I'm asking you to give them patience that they didn't know they had. I'm asking you to give them grace. I'm asking you to allow them to give themselves grace, God. We are not perfect. We're we're just but humans that you've created and we're gonna screw this up. So Father, I'm praying that they would be reminded of how much you love them, of how much you care for them, of how you've equipped them and built them, and you have put it in them to do this. God, they can do this by your power, by your grace, uh, with your help, God. We can do this as parents. So will you remind them of that in this week when they feel like a failure, when they feel like they screwed up again, God, when we all feel like we're not sure what to do and we feel overwhelmed and we feel worn out, God, I pray that you will remind us that you are there for us, that you love us, that you're proud of us, that, you, um, that you're our king. So, Father, that's what we're asking. We pray a special blessing over all of our parents, God. And we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Ryan. Hey, thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, just so glad you were able to, to get on with us. Um, we look forward to seeing you sometime in person we know that's going to happen but until then um until then just remember hope wins and we are here to support you in any way that we can that's right that's a future hook we want to support you in any way we can so please reach out to us if there's anything that we can do for you guys have a great night we'll see you later